All right, wonderful. Here we go. Welcome everybody back to Monday Night Jewish Essentials, the greatest hour of the work week in the greatest place in South Florida. Yes, yes, we are here once again. Okay, so tonight we're talking about the hidden history of December 25th. All the things you want to know about the day, but we're afraid to ask or we're just never had the opportunity to ask, will hopefully be addressed tonight. We'll talk about what the Jewish perspective of the day is and sort of where to go, where to go from here. Okay? So I always like sharing this story because um, it happened about three years ago now. So our neighborhood, when, uh, <laughs> when it, this time of year comes around, so there's there's one street that is there's there's uh, one street that is very very decorated, and so when we when, when I walk in with my kids on Shabbat home from the shul or to shul, um, we we pass through this na- this this block that is every house is well decorated. So three years ago, my then a uh, four-year-old, Mushka, was walking with me, and uh, we passed a nativity scene. And she's like, look, Tati, it's a baby. And I was like, yep, yep, a baby. So we're going to talk about that baby tonight, and we're going to talk about um, some of the, the surrounding uh, festivities that, that take place on December 25th and sort of the history, the meaning, and the Jewish explanation. Uh, Sound like fun? Yes. All right, let's do it. So, popular myth would have the founder of Christianity born on December 25th in the year 1 CE, right? The year 1 of the Common Era. Now, the truth of the matter is, though, that the New Testament, the the main source, right, the Gospels, the main source of Christian theology doesn't give a date for the birth of its founder, the birth of J.C. The earliest Gospel, which is Mark, which dates to around 65 CE, begins with an adult version of J.C., an adult version. Early Christians, in fact, lacked any interest or any knowledge of the birthday of J.C. In fact, they viewed the idea of a birthday as sort of a heathen practice. The reason for that is that the only birthday that's mentioned in the Bible is the birthday of Pharaoh. And so to, to think about, you know, trying to find a birthday for J.C. or worrying about birthdays was not on the agenda. In fact, the third century church father, Origen, declared that it's a sin to even think of keeping J.C.'s birthday, right, as though he were akin to Pharaoh. So this was, this idea was also confirmed by the Catholic Encyclopedia in the early part of the 20th century, that in Scripture, sinners alone, not saints, celebrate their birthdays, right, which is why perhaps... um, uh, Arlene, you were mentioning that uh, that you had met met a family that is, ha, is belongs to one of the denominations of Christianity, but they themselves did not keep with the practice. Oh, oh, oh Esther, right? They did not keep with it with the practice and festivities that usually accompany December twenty fifth, and this is the reason why the early church fathers had no connection with it. It was not it was not important. It was not something that they were trying to seek out. It had nothing to do with the day and with their faith. Now, when was J.C. born according to the Christians? What year? Right, so we know December 25th is not a thing. What about the year one? What year was he born? So the, the calendar that we use now, the Gregorian calendar, was preceded by uh, the Julian calendar, right? And we... we now use, right, the calendar that the secular calendar that's used is, is called, um, when, it, when you say like it's 2018, people say AD, 
A lot of people think that means after death. It doesn't mean after death. It means Anno Domini, which means the year of our Lord, which is not something that Jewish people use and say because it's not our Lord, obviously. But this, this idea, this, this calendar system, was something that was introduced by an Eastern European monk in the 6th century named Dionysius Exegus. Before that, during the times of J.C., they were, they were, the Roman Empire was using the starting date, like year one, was year one AUC, which was ab urbe condita, which means from the founding of the city of Rome. So the, the, the years that they were counting from, every calendar, right, the Chinese calendar, the Jewish calendar, we all have calendars, we all have dates and years that we're starting from, like what event is marking the beginning of your calendar. So in Rome, during the time of J.C., it was ab urbe condita from the founding of the city of Rome. So when Dionysius Exegus in the 6th century was trying to reformat the calendar system and begin it with the birth of J.C., he miscalculated the years. And so uh, the year one is actually several years later than the birth of J.C. This is not something that the Jewish scholars uh, know and that nobody else knows, like our, our little secret. This is something that is attested to not only by historians, but even major players in the church uh, are, it's unanimous that the year one was not the year that J.C. was born. And in fact, the previous pope, Pope Benedict, wrote in one of his books that it's, like, it's, it's, it's much more likely that he was born somewhere between 2 and 7 BCE, right? Two, between 2 to 7 BCE, right? So it, it, for us, it doesn't seem to make sense because the year one, I mean, what are you counting from otherwise? So, we, so December 25th, not necessarily a thing. Uh, the year one, not a thing. So December 25th, year one CE, nothing out of the ordinary happened. That is for sure. So how did December 25th come to be what it is today? How did that day become a day that was picked to celebrate the birthday of J.C.? The truth is, in the early, if you look at some of the early church writings, there were many other dates that were suggested as to when to celebrate. When they decided they were going to start celebrating it, there were other dates that were celebrated. Very early records show something like March 28th. Clement, the bishop, the bishop of Alexandria in 215 CE, said November 18th should be the day that it was marked on. Uh, other dates include March 25th, May 20th, and there's, there's, a, there's quite a number of other dates that were suggested as the dates that would be the one that marked the birthday of J.C. So where, where does December 25th come from? December 25th, interestingly, let's take it back to its original state. In the Collins Encyclopedia, it discusses a holiday that was widely observed in Roman times, but that had its early roots even in ancient Egypt. Ancient Egypt, 3000 BCE, in the days of King Osiris and his wife Isis. Now, the legend was that after the death of King Osiris, his wife Isis said that a full-grown evergreen tree sprouted up overnight right, from a dead tree stump, and that symbolized the spurning forth of a new life for Osiris. And on the anniversary of his birth, she claimed that Osiris would visit the evergreen tree and leave gifts there. When was Osiris' birthday? December 25th. Interestingly enough, though, in Babylon as well, there was a feast of the son of Isis, right, the goddess of nature, which was also observed on December the 25th. It was celebrated with partying and gluttonous activity, gluttonous eating and drinking, um, and gift giving. 
So in Babylon, it was observed that way. In ancient Egypt, this there was a, a tradition of an evergreen tree appearing with gifts on December 25th. In fact, the pagans all over northern Europe had various holidays that were celebrated right around the winter solstice. The Germanic peoples, they celebrated their own winter solstice holiday called Yule. Right? You've, many of you have even heard that term before. Yule was symbolic of the pagan sun god Mithras being born. Right? S-U-N, the sun god. So in order to sort of celebrate the birthday of the sun god, logs were burned for the sun god. Evergreen trees were also brought into people's homes because they lasted throughout the winter. They were always green. In Rome, there was another holiday, also connected with winter solstice, also commemorated and finalized on December 25th. This celebrated in Latin, Natalis Solis Invicti, which means the birthday of the invincible sun god, S-U-N. Mithra, or Mithras, was the sun god, S-U-N, and this is a practice, a, a sort of a tradition or cult that was started in Persia. And it became popular, very popular, in fact, in first century Rome. It became so popular, in fact, in first century Rome that the emperor Aurelian in 274 CE, 274, made Mithraism the official, lay, the official religion of the Roman Empire. So Mithra's day, the day where the sun, S-U-N, is worshipped and born on December 25th, was, was the religion, the widespread official religion of the Roman Empire. In fact, Mithraism was so popular in the, in the beginning of the, of the first and second century, right, and, and through, the, through the third century, it was unclear as to whether Mithraism or Catholicism would be the official religion of the Roman Empire. They were both very popular. They were both gaining a lot of steam, gaining a lot of, uh, a lot of adherence and a lot of interest. And so it, was, it wasn't clear which one was going to be the dominant religion of the Roman Empire. Not too long after the Emperor Aurelian made Mithraism, right, we said that was in 274 CE, not long after that, Constantine is Emperor of Rome now, he converts to Catholicism, this is the year 325 CE, so we're talking about about 50 years difference, and 50 years later he makes Roman Catholicism, right, Rome, Roman Catholicism, the official religion of the Roman Empire. Okay, fine. So that's, so that's sort of the history. Now, the idea that the Christians chose the 25th of December because it was the date that was already a festival celebrating the birthday of the sun god, S-U-N, Mithra, is not some again not something that the Jewish people are projecting or that historians are projecting. This is even something that was mentioned in early Christian texts. There's a manuscript written by a 12th century Syrian bishop named Jacob Bar Salibi, and he writes, right, this the scribe writes in, in his writings that it was a custom of the pagans to celebrate December 20th as the birthday of the sun, the S-U-N, right? The sun god on which they kindled lights as a token of the festivity. And in these gatherings, Christians also took part. And so when the doctors of the early church, when the, when the fathers of the early church perceived that the Christians had a leaning, had an interest in the festival, they sort of uh, also commemorated the day of celebrating their own their own god or their own religion with the same with similar types of festivities. One thing that we're going to notice as we discuss some of the customs that are associated with December 25th today is we're going to take lesson that amongst early church fathers in order to gain adherence 
a lot of times different things that were already sort of popular were incorporated in order to make the transition much easier. And uh, let me tell you who else uses that. There, you know, the, the group that became very popular in the 60s and 70s, Jews for Jesus, right? In other words, they've been trying to convert the Jewish people. There, there have been groups that have been missionizing to the Jewish people for nearly 2,000 years. And the Jewish people, for the most part, have not been particularly embracing of, of, this, of these missionary activities. And so the, the new you know, epiphany, the new idea in the 60s and 70s of a sort of an easy way or an easier way to sort of reach out to the Jewish world was that keep your religion, keep your Hanukkah latkes, right? Keep your Passover Seder, keep your Rosh Hashanah, keep your Shofar, keep all everything, all the Jewish things that you do, keep them all. Just be a Jew for Jesus. Right? You don't have to give up anything. You go to Hanukkah dinner, you go to Passover dinner, you go to uh, Rosh Hashanah dinner. Keep all of these things. But just add a little bit extra. Re right? Di reassess where your attention is being directed in these festivities. And so this was a tactic that the early church uh, also implemented as a way to sort of easily, you know, gain acceptance and a following. You know, you imagine taking something that people enjoy, trying to take it away and saying, okay, then now the new religion is this. It's going to, there's going to be some hesitation over there. If everybody's, wor if everyone until yesterday was worshiping Mithraism and, Sat and, and celebrating the Saturnalia festival, right? Worshiping the sun god. And everyone's used to certain practices and observance of serving the sun god. So people don't like parting with their traditions. People like doing, you know, you, you have your things that you've been doing with your family and they did it with, my, my parents did it with their parents and their parents did it with their, it's not an easy thing to just say, okay, you know, Constantine said the official religion is, is Catholicism, but just drop everything. They, what they did instead was they kept all the festivities, all the trimmings around it and just sort of redirected who it's being devoted towards, who the devotion, who the worship is being devoted towards. It was the S-U-N God, now we worship the S-O-N, right? It was, we were worshiping the sun God, now we're just, okay, now we're directing it to God, to, right? To, and so that is, we find that throughout many of the practices that were incorporated into, um, into early Christian practice, it was an easy way to sort of transition from you know, the outright pagan beliefs that people previously had to, 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 uh, into, into Christian monotheism, right? It was sort of a way to sort of uh, take the next step in an easy way. And people are like, okay, you know, whatever, as long as we can still get together with our family and, you know, celebrate these certain practices and observe it in the same way, then I don't really care if it's this guy, this guy, it's, well, you know, what's the difference? It makes it a lot easier. Now, Saturnalia, this festival that went on around winter solstice time in, uh, in the, during the times of the Roman Empire, was instituted by Romulus, right, who was the founder of the city of Rome. This is a winter solstice holiday. And basically what this week-long winter solstice holiday, which means the end of December, right, December 17th through the 25th, this holiday was a week-long period of lawlessness. For that week-long period, Roman courts were closed, right? Roman law dictated that no one could be punished for damaging anybody's property, for injuring people. It was just a free-for-all, basically. In fact, this week-long celebration of sort of chaos represented the world returning back to its topsy-turvy state in a state of chaos, right? Even at the Bi even in the beginning of the Bible, it says at the beginning, right? There was toihu vavoyu, right? It was chaos. It was a chaotic beginning, and so this beginning, this this period of time of lawlessness, represented the world returning to its previous state of lawlessness. Of, of chaos. And so everything, 
during that week-long period went on its opposite. Every, everything was, all roles were reversed to symbolize the chaos, which meant slaves became masters and masters became slaves just for that week period. Lucian, who is a Greek historian, describes the festival in his time. He says, in addition to human sacrifice, which was something not widely practiced, but practiced, in addition to that, he mentioned these customs, widespread intoxication, okay, uh, going from house to house while singing, naked at the time, right? not that anymore, um, rape and other sorts of uh, sexual license, and consuming of human-shaped biscuits, human-shaped cookies. Yeah. yeah. Now, you can see where certain things kind of, you know, like, why is that part? Oh, a lot of, a lot of the loose ends and some of the customs we see, like, like, why is that even connected with, and then you, you look what's some of the back history to other winter solstice holidays that were going on at the time, and different practices, different customs were just sort of incorporated together. Like people liked doing that, so all right, keep it on board. Now, the question is like this. Here's an interesting question. Why was it that across Europe, across pagan Europe, before Roman times even, but also during Roman times, why was it that in pre-Christian pagan Europe, there were so many different um, peoples celebrating a holiday connected with the winter solstice. Why did they all come up with this same idea? How did, where did it all come from? And so the answer to this question is fascinatingly discussed in the Talmud. The Talmud tells us why all of these pagan peoples that existed before Christianity why they all pick the winter solstice time as a time of festivity. So what does the Talmud say? This is the Gemara and the Vaidazara. It says something really interesting. It says that when Adam, Adam, the very first human being, right, think about when was he created? He was created just before Rosh Hashanah. Right? He was created on, he was on, on Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah celebrates the birthday of Adam. So, Rosh Hashanah is in the fall, or what we know today is the fall, right? And so after his sin, what starts happening that time of year in the fall, and then especially in the winter time? As the days go on, day after day, the daylight period gets shorter, right? Beginning in the fall, day after day, and especially as you near the winter, the day is much shorter. And so Adam, the first man, after his sin, begins to notice that the days are getting shorter and shorter. Daylight hours are becoming less and less. Darkness is prevailing. And so Adam is a little bit nervous. He thought that he was the cause of it, that his sin in the Garden of Eden was the cause of now the days are slowly getting shorter. Daylight is, is going away and it's getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And he was very troubled by this. He thought he was the cause of this. So he, when, he, when he got near the, the end of the year, or the end of, at the end of the, uh, towards, the, towards the winter solstice time, he began to pray and to fast and to do a real sincere apology that, you know, that he didn't want the world to revert back to the darkness and chaos of the original, to, of, of what it was before creation. He thought that he was causing the darkness to increase. Then when the winter solstice hit, what begins to happen when the winter solstice hits? When the winter solstice hits, after that, the days start getting a little bit longer. Daylight hours get a little bit longer. So it's getting dark, 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 and, and Adam doesn't know what he's going to do, and he fasts, and he prays, and he, and he thinks he's the cause of it. And then after the winter solstice, he sees that the days are getting longer, and the following year noticed that, okay, this is just the way of the world, and he decided to make a commemoration, a, 
days of celebration, a week-long festivity commemorating just before the winter solstice, right? That, that light will prevail. That no matter how dark it gets, don't worry, it's going to, light will prevail. Now, just like a lot of things that happened from the days of Adam on, when Adam's children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren saw a festival commemorating, celebrating the fact that the sun is triumphant, that light is triumphant around the winter solstice, what it became, it became convoluted with idolatry. And instead of celebrating, thanking God for creating a world that functions in an order where there's different seasons, where there's different periods, where it's lighter and it's darker, and it became associated with the victory of the sun itself, S-U-N, the sun itself. The sun was victorious, the victory of the sun god. Once it became acceptable, and once it became an object of worship itself, the sun, the holiday that Adam had instituted, these days of praise and, and thanks to Hashem, became instead days of gratitude to the sun. The day where the sun is born, right? Because it's getting dark and dark and dark, and it's almost, right, you think that just when you think that the day is going to disappear, there's not going to be any daylight hours left, boom, the sun comes back strong, the sun is born, right? And that's what the winter solstice days were all celebrating. So across Europe, across ancient pagan Europe, you had various cultures, various peoples observing a holiday that was connected with the winter solstice and all celebrating the same thing, the victory of the sun. So in the fourth century, Pope Julius I declared that the birthday of J.C. would be celebrated on December 25th. So it wasn't until the 4th century that that was decided to be the day. And Christianity, early, early Christianity, imported a lot of these Saturnalia festivals and festivities in, in, a, in an attempt to convert the pagans, in an attempt to make an easy transition, right? You don't have to just redirect redirect who you're who you're dedicating your devotion to but other than that keep all the festivities as as you as you always practice them right whatever whatever you were doing for saturnalia right keep those customs keep them together you know, let's talk about the origin of the tree christmas tree you know in biblical times in many locations trees were worshiped in fact this is an interesting uh, quote from the beginning, not the beginning of uh, Jeremiah chapter 10, right? Yirmiyahu chapter 10, starting on verse 2. It says like this, So says the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed by the signs of heaven. For the heathen, the pagan, are dismayed by them. For the customs of the people are vain. They cut the tree out of the forest, the work of the hands and work of the workmen with an axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it not move. Sound familiar? So I'm not saying that the tree that is used now is the same tree and worshipped in the same style. I'm not saying that at all. But the idea of bringing a tree in, into one's home and making that up, this has its root in early pagan practices. Plants and trees that remain green all year round actually had significance to many of the people uh, from different, uh, from different uh, traditions, pagan traditions across Europe. Uh, for the Romans, why, why, was it, why was it that those trees, right, trees that were green all year round, even through the cold winter, were so, excuse me, were so symbolic? Because the Romans, right, knew that solstice meant that farms and orchards would soon be green and fruitful. It was a reminder, right? You you look into the forest, right? You ever you ever see a, a forest in the snow? I remember my first time up north. I went to school in New Jersey, and I remember the first time seeing snow, right, in rabbinical college, and seeing a forest, 
right? I'm from Florida. I, I don't know if it's snow. I don't know what snow is, right? And the first time seeing it, the very first weekend, it, the, the, I mean, you look out, it looks like a scene of just death for a Floridian anyway. It's, I mean, it's gray skies. All the leaves are off the trees. But an evergreen tree remains green even during that, you know, that death scene. And so this reminded the Romans that, you know, of the, of the, the uh, fields and fruits that would soon be uh, blossoming throughout the, uh, af after, the, uh, after the harsh winter. Now, in Northern Europe, the Druids, right, the Celts, um, they saw this, you know, the, the trees that stayed green all year round as a symbol of everlasting life, right? Amongst all this death, you have one tree that stays forever. Right? The Vikings in Scandinavia also thought that evergreens were a special plant of the sun god, Balder. Okay? So you had, throughout Europe, various cultures, various peoples, attributing a certain special significance to evergreen trees because, again, they stayed green amidst death. They were everlasting, symbolized everlasting life. They're always alive. No matter what's going on around them, they remain alive. The contemporary practice of Christmas trees, right, as it's known today, is, Germany is credited with starting it as it's known today. Right? In the 16th century, when devout Christians brought decorated trees into their homes, this was a practice in Germany. In 18, uh, in German, German settlers in the 1800s are, are the first uh, Christmas trees in the New World. Right, so we're talking 1800s, not all that long ago. In 1846, the popular royals, popular royal family, Queen Victoria and her German prince Albert, um, were sketched in, uh, in, an in the Illustrated London News, standing with their children around their Christmas tree. Remember, he was German prince Albert. Right? And from there, when it was printed with, with the royalty around, you know, it, it became a very popular thing. Even, even in the New World, even in, even in the Americas, people saw the pictures like, wow, that's such a, what a nice scene. What a great scene. And so the, the popularity of it really sort of took off after that. Now, um, the idea of presence, giving presence. So in pre-Christian Rome, uh, there, one of the things that it says, so in the, in the Encyclopedia Americana, it says that most of the customs that are now associated with December 25th were not originally Christian customs, right? They were mostly from pre-church, pre-Christian times. So uh, during Saturnalia, a Roman feast, which was celebrated in mid-December, which we talked about, it says that it provided... Um, it, was, it was accompanied by, you know, gift giving, and, right, the burning of candles. In fact, the New York Times in the early 90s ran, ran an article on December 24th, right, 1991. You can go look it up. Uh, it's from Professor uh, uh, Simon Shama from, from uh, Harvard, I believe. And he says, in the same way that Kalends was replaced with the Feast of the Epiphany and um, other pagan festivals were replaced with Christian festivals. So too, the practices of, of uh, you know, were, were, were borrowed. So in other words, the, the story of like the three kings bringing gifts became associated. Okay, so it's a time for everyone to sort of have this gift exchange. It was, the gift exchange was something that was connected with several of the winter solstice holidays. Now, the one really interesting uh, origin is the origin of Santa Claus, right? Because that's, I mean, that's, we know that that's not necessarily like a particularly religious thing. So let's talk about where, right, Nicholas, right, St. Nick, right, where, where, that, where that all came about. So Nicholas was born in Turkey in the year 270 CE. So he's a third century uh, person, um, and he later became the Bishop of Myra. And he died in the year 345 CE, on December the 6th, right? That was the day that Nicholas passed away. And he was only named a saint in, in the church in the 19th century. 
right? So until then, he was Nicholas. In the 11th century, a group of sailors who idolized Nicholas, Nicholas was, was very special in their eyes, they moved his bones from Turkey, where he was buried. Remember, he's from Turkey, he lived in Turkey. They took his bones from Turkey to a sanctuary in Bari, Italy. All right, so from Turkey to Italy. Now, the, the, uh, the popularity, the idea of Nicholas was, was something that was fairly popular in Italy at, at the time, it was gaining popularity and became, especially when they brought his, bone, brought his bones to Bari, Italy from Turkey. And there was also a custom of a gift-giving grandmother named Pascua Epiphania in Italy at the time. And when, when Nicholas's bones were moved and sort of the hype got surrounded uh, around Nicholas, Pasca Fafinia was out, right? Grant, the, grand, the gift-giving grandmother was out, right? Kick out Granny from her post and replace this gift-giving individual with Nicholas. Nicholas becomes the new gift-giving person. And members of the group would give gifts, right? They, they'd have a whole pageant. It would be a whole thing. Um, and they would celebrate it every year on Nicholas's, uh, the day of Nicholas's death, which was December the 6th. Now, this Nicholas practice, right, this, uh, the idea of a gift-giving Nicholas, the idea spread further along in, 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 uh, in Europe. So as it's spreading along in Europe, it reaches the German, the, the German people, the Celtics, the, the, the Celtic pagans, and these groups worshipped a whole slew of, excuse me, a whole slew of gods. One of them was led by Woden, who was their chief god, right? The father of Thor, Balder, and two. Woden, the, the chief god right, of, the, of, the, of the German pagans, he had a, a long white beard, and he rode a horse through the air one night each autumn. And so when the Nicholas uh, trend was spreading across Europe, it got merged with the Woden, right? The, the, the Woden figure, right? Who was a, a, a bearded figure who rode a horse through the night giving gifts. And they just sort of reshifted everything. Again, the Christians, the early Christians, in order to gain converts and just make whatever, whatever people were observing at the time, they just incorporated it together. And so he said, instead of having their God Woden giving gifts throughout the night, we'll talk about Nicholas giving gifts through the night. And let's say he's going to do it on December 25th or December 24th at night going into the 25th. And so in a bid to gain adherence in Northern Europe, the Catholic Church adapted this Nicholas tradition. And Nicholas, again, Nicholas is Turkish. Nicholas is from Turkey. He certainly doesn't look like, you know, what you find on a, a Coca-Cola, right? <laughs> Think of a Turkish person as a Middle Eastern person. And so when he was merged with the god Woden, he began to take on some of the features with the beard and he lost his Middle Eastern look and, and developed a much more European style of, of just look. And then in 1809, the novelist Washington Irving, right? We all know from Rip Van Winkle, Legend of Sleepy Hollow. He wrote a satire on Dutch history called Knickerbocker History. And in there, Right, then this is 1809, relatively recently. The satire refers several times to a white bearded Santa, right? A white, be a white bearded uh, Saint Nicholas, right? Who flies on a horse, right? But using his Dutch name, Sinterklaas, right? And so Saint Nick's Dutch name, Sinterklaas, became, right, Santa Claus. So then, they, then Dr. Clement Moore, who was a professor, uh, a professor at Union Seminary, he read Knickerbocker History, right, which was by Washington Irving. 
And he just and when he wrote when he read it, he was inspired to write a poem in 1822. He wrote a children's poem that year. You may remember it. Twas the night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung right with the chimney uh, by the chimney with care, in hopes that Saint Nicholas right soon would be there. More Clement Moore innovated right with Santa as with uh, having reindeer instead of the horse and uh, with the stockings he's the one who put it together and his poem became very popular uh and so the final step came in the early 1900s right so under 100 years ago which uh, actually was late, the late 1800s there was a there was a bavarian illustrator thomas nast and he actually had a I, when, when i was in rabbinical school in morristown Right, he, he, he actually lived in Morristown. So my route that I would go every Friday to go put film with people, right, there was a sign out front of his house that says this is the house of Thomas Nast. Thomas Nast, a lot of us know him. We don't realize that we know him, but he's the one who invented the, 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 the Democrat donkey and the Republican elephant. He was, the, he was a political cartoonist. He, you know, Harper's Weekly was his publication, was extraordinarily popular in the late 1800s. And he's the one who really pumped out many, many pictures and, and uh, you know, drawings of, of Santa Claus. That, that's what, that's what, you know, he, 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 donned, he, he got rid of his, you know, his, uh, his uh, former clothing and put on this new, like, winter clothes. Uh, winter clothing and had him in the North Pole with the elves and the whole that's when it really came together in the way that we know it today and that only became even more popularized in the 1930s when Coca-Cola began to uh, you know make a coke drinking Santa which is why always since then you only see Santa in a big bright red uh, suit so Santa Claus is a mix of basically um, early Christian, early Christian father, um, with a bunch of pagan traditions and a little bit of uh, Coke advertising on the side. Things like Rudolph didn't come around until the 1940, 1939, I think, when the, the Montgomery Ward department store wanted to make like a. A, 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 an advertisement for kids. They had this song book that if you're the first shoppers, you get this song book with, uh, with Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, right? Originally it was Rollo, then it was Reginald, and then finally Rudolph, right? Frosty didn't come around to the 1950s. So uh, again, we see that a lot of these cultural things that we assume to be so much a part of the day uh, didn't come so much later. Now, December 25th has never been a day that has been particularly fun for the Jewish people. It hasn't been a day that's fun for Jews. The, the practices that accompanied it, all the Saturnalia practices, all the, the chaos and the, you know, just the um, intoxication and wild partying and everything like that, was not something that a lot of Christian groups endorsed. Christmas was banned by the Puritans. They, they did not allow it to be, to be celebrated. William Bradford, who we talked about, we really talk about over Thanksgiving time, who was the second governor of the Pilgrims, he wrote that he tried to stamp out this, quote, pagan mockery, calling Christmas a pagan holiday, a pagan mockery. Also, the influential Oliver Cromwell preached against the, quote, heathen traditions of caroling and decorating trees, and he and it was made this, the celebration of Christmas was illegal in Massachusetts between 1659 and 1681. Now, during those December 25th, again for the Jews was not particularly pleasant. Um, many of the depraved customs of the Saturnalia uh, were done every single year, practiced and encouraged by the medieval Catholic Church and the Catholic Church during the Renaissance period. Um, you know, the Catholic Church in 1466, for example, when Pope Paul II, for the amusement of his Roman citizens, forced the Jews to walk naked through the streets of the city. 
And one of the eyewitness accounts, we have a diary of, the eye, of an eyewitness account who was there in Rome, 1466, on, on December 25th. And they said before they were made to run, the Jews were richly fed to make the race that much more difficult for them, but much more amusing for the spectators. They ran amidst Rome's taunting shrieks and, per, and, and peals of laughter when the Holy Father, the Pope, right, stood up in rich, a richly ornamented balcony and laughed heartily. So again, it's not a day that was traditionally a particularly fun day for the Jews. Two centuries later, right, so now we're in the, 16, the 1600s, these types of practices were deemed unbefitting to the dignity of the holy city, and Pope Clement IX instead decided to tax the Jews to pay for the festivities that would go on in the, in the city. So rather than having them you know, running through the streets naked or doing all sorts of you know, practices, they, they'll tax them, and the, and the tax money will go to pay for the festivities. <laughs> Throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, rabbis of the ghetto of, the ghetto of Rome were forced to wear clownish outfits and march through the city streets to jeers by, you know, crowds and onlookers being pelted by by very by rocks and by other you know other objects. In Pisa, it was customary to find the fattest Jew in the city and to capture him and weigh him and make him pay his make him pay his weight his his weight um, in sugar coated almonds. So I mean, like these are not fun practices and certainly not fun times for the Jews. When the Jewish community sent a petition to Rome in 1836, again, relatively not that long ago, Pope Gregory the uh, they, they, they sent it to Pope Gregory the Sixteenth, begging him to, to call off the, the traditions, the customs, the depraved practices of the Saturnalia festival that still were present in the city of Rome. And he responded, it's not, an op it's not opportune to make any innovations at this time. And so again, throughout Europe, constant anti-Semitic frenzies that led riots across, across different countries. Jews were beatily, uh, you know, beaten, sometimes murdered, you know, many injured, and many Jewish women were raped, property was destroyed. I mean, it was not a pleasant time in our history. Now, that actually leads us to the discussion, there is a tradition that is still practiced in various communities, that on December 24th, in the evening, the custom is not to study Torah. There, again, it's not, it's not universal in the Jewish world, but historically, many people, right, from the Marsha to Rabbi Yonis and Ibeshitz, all participated in this practice of the eve, right, to December 24th, in the evening, not to not to study Torah, and there are various reasons why. Number one, it was dangerous. You know, it's a novel that nowadays in all of our homes we have, you know, books, we have library, we, have, we can purchase books very inexpensively. Back in the day, if you wanted to study, you had to go to the synagogue, you had to go to the, you know, the base medrash, you had to go to a, a study house. You know, it, to go outside during that night when all the revelry was going on, it was a dangerous situation. And so the rabbi said, okay, you know what, just Let's not learn Torah that night because it's, it's dangerous. You're going to go outside, you're going to get beat up, or worse. And so they would just basically go to sleep. They would shut off the lights, and that would be it. That's one reason why Torah study was not studied uh, during that night. Another reason why December 24th in the evening, there's a custom. In the same way that on Tisha B'Av, we don't learn Torah because Torah gladdens the heart. And on Tisha B'Av, we're meant to be sad. And so we don't want to do something that's gladdening our heart when we're meant to be commemorating sadness, it's sad times and the destruction of the temple. And so what, being that December 24th and 25th in the evening in particular was a dangerous time and had not been a particularly nice time for the Jewish people, as a sign of mourning, Torah was not studied in that, in, during that frame uh, either. There are other reasons that are mentioned for more Kabbalistic reasons that when you study Torah, you add vitality, you add spiritual vitality to the world, and a day that has been dedicated to the worship of a God that is, 
theologically different than the Jewish concept of God to give to to you know invigorate vitality on such a day was also seen by the mystics, those of a, of a Kabbalistic bent, also seen as something that was inappropriate to do. So for various reasons, in some communities, Chabad included, don't learn Torah the 24th at night. Right? It's a good day to order, order out kosher Chinese food, right? Now, let's, let's end the idea on a positive note. You know, thank God Thank God that certainly in the last half of the 20th century, these types of depraved practices and customs and you know, animosity and divisiveness from what used to be practiced and, and antagonized against the Jews has basically, thank God, been... Is, 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 has been significantly reduced, certainly from the Christian world as a whole. And that's a wonderful thing. And we have, to, we have to look at everything in a positive light. We have to try and see um, the world, humanity, you know, as one common mission with one common goal. And one of the things that the Rambam writes, right, the famed medieval sage Maimonides, he writes something very interesting. He says that the purpose of Christianity, why was Christianity sort of brought onto the scene? The Christianity was brought, right, the, the, that, that, that's, you know, the founder of Christianity was born and the whole, everything that came about from that took place in order to get the nations of the world out of their paganism. Because before Christianity came to the world, the pagan practices that were going on were just were, were, were outrageous. They were, they were violent, they were immoral on so many levels, they were idolatrous. What Christianity did, what wonderful thing that Christianity did do for the world is brought many of the pagan nations of the world that were engaged in the most depraved practices, it brought them out of pure paganism. Before it was pure, unadulterated paganism with the worst practices. But now, right, throughout the centuries, Christianity has, has gone throughout the world and brought them, brought the nations certain key principles that are even shared in the Torah. The concept of, you know, that there's God and that there's, there's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and that there's a purpose to this world and that there's reward and punishment and there's a concept of Mashiach and <clears throat> all these different, all, all of these different concepts that are in line with the Torah. They've done a good service for us. They've, they've spread, you know, not in, not, in its, not in its original form, not in its purest form, but an ultimate like Torah, you know, untainted Torah view. But some of the main concepts, some of the important ideas that were necessary, that are necessary for all of humanity to know, the Christians have, have done an amazing job of spreading those key concepts to the farthest islands in the sea. All across continents, you know, taking tribal people and turning them into people who have a concept, right? That there's Mashiach, that there's a Messiah, that, that there, there's something to anticipate. Again, I'm not saying that everything lines up theologically, but from where they came from, from, from much, it, Christianity has done a service in sort of paving the way for the ultimate, for, for the actual Mashiach. And it has already, it has dispensed concepts that the nations of the world needed to know and need to know in order to bring that universal consciousness to fruition. And so I say, in line, I, I believe, with the Rambam, that now that we live in times where, where this type of uh, where religious discussion is something that we can have with our, our non-Jewish neighbors, or with our Christian neighbors, with discussing God and discussing purpose and discussing that there is a God who has moral, a moral code for the world, this is a great opportunity, something that we've never had 
really, throughout our history, the chance to talk to our non-Jewish neighbors about the purpose why, why we are all here together. To make the world into a godly place. Our job is not to convert anybody. We don't, we're not seeking converts. We're not trying to persuade anybody to be like us. But at the same time, utilizing this friendliness, which, which, which there is, but taking the initiative, we, the Jewish people, as Isaiah says, we are the light to the nations. We're meant to be a light to the nations, to reach out to our neighbors, to our friends, and tell them there's a Torah that was given by God, and this Torah was given that the Jewish people be a light unto the nations, and it's up to us to work together to make the world into a very wonderful place, make the world into a moral place, make the world into a divine place. And that's something that we can both work on together. We'll do it as Jews, you do it as the nations of the world, but together we can work together and make this world into a wonderful, wonderful place. And it's no doubt, there's no doubt, that all of us working together to achieve this goal by going to our neighbor and going to our friends and talking about Torah in a real way will be a light to them and will be something that they will carry as a light to others as well. And ultimately, we will make the world into an illuminated place, fully illuminated, and there will be no choice, but Mashiach will have to be here, will have to be revealed, and together we can all serve God with one voice. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.